particularly in endeavoring to effect a separation of the western part of the United States from that which lies between oops, the Atlantic and the mountains in its whole extent. His proposition on this and other subjects will be fully detailed to your lordship by Colonel Williamson, who has been the bearer of them to me and who will embark for England in a few days. So, a lot of you will know, this is Aaron Burr, by Mr. Burr. It's Aaron Burr who shot Alexander Hamilton. He was, wow, just a filthy, filthy character. So he's vice president of the United States. This is right after his killing Hamilton. Because he's vice president, he's the head of the Senate, and so he's, um, he has immunity right from the charges of murder from the states of New Jersey and New York. So he just goes back to Washington, D.C., goes back to preside over the Senate, and then is in touch with uh, these British agents in the United States conspiring to split the United States. So some of the characters in this scene are these leading merchant and banking families in Boston. This is a letter from Timothy Pickering to George Cabot. These are members of what was called the Essex Junto out of Essex County, Massachusetts, and they were this cabal running all types of operations um, to destroy the United States. So Pickering says, I do not believe in the practicability of a long continued union. A Northern Confederacy would unite congenial characters and present a fairer prospect of public happiness. While the southern states, having similarity of habits, might be left to manage their affairs in their own way. I greatly doubt whether prudence should suffer the connection to continue much longer. But when and how is a separation to be effected? It must begin in Massachusetts. See, would anyone suspect like now that we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, that it was the North that seceded from the Union or tried to split. But this is where this idea starts from. So anyway, so well, again, it's not even the North and the South of the United States. It's these British agents operating in the United States to destroy the initial success of this experiment of a republic. So he says, it must begin in Massachusetts. The proposition would be welcomed in Connecticut, and could we doubt of New Hampshire? But New York must be associated. And how is her concurrence to be obtained? She must be made the center of the Confederacy. Vermont and New Jersey would follow, of course, and Rhode Island of necessity. Who can be consulted, and who will take the lead? So that being January 29th, 1804, to George Cabot, the response from George Cabot, or at least it's a letter from Cabot to Pickering on February 14th, 1804. I think I just have some typos. It's misspelled, sorry. All the evils you describe and many more are to be apprehended. But I greatly fear that a separation would be no remedy, because the source of them is in the political theories of our country and in ourselves. We are democratic altogether, and I hold democracy and its natural operation to be the government of the worst. They obviously want a British aristocracy. That would be the best. At the same time that I do not desire a separation at the moment, I add that it's not practicable without intervention of some cause which should be very generally felt and distinctly understood as chargeable to the misconduct of our southern masters. I incline to the opinion that the essential alterations which may in the future 
future be made to amend our form of government. That's the real thing we have to do, not just separate the United States, but actually change the system of government in the Constitution. To do that will be the consequences of only a great suffering or the immediate effects of violence. Separation will be unavoidable when our loyalty to the Union is generally perceived to be the instrument of debasement and impoverishment. If a separation should, by and by, be produced by suffering, I think it might be accompanied by important ameliorations of our theories. So, but this in itself, so what they're doing is this cabal, and they do all types of things to, to create the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement in the South, all geared around, we just need to split the country. But even that's a real sophistry because these Boston merchants are the ones running the slave trade. They're the ones that own the ships, right, or, or are in cahoots with the companies that are, and they're bringing them into the South. Or the people in the South that came, came specifically as a reaction to the, the success of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and what they were doing in the early 1600s. Like, um, in South Carolina, the family, let me get the name right. So the slave trading family that came to South Carolina in, the, in 1687, because remember the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, was 1620. I have these dates right? 1630. In 1630, the Massachusetts Bay Colony established the city of Boston. They were running all of their incredible experiments about self-government, public credit, you know, all the development of machinery and manufacturing. Uh, Plymouth Rock was in 1620, so the Mayflower, the whole idea of, right, this group fleeing Europe, and so they were starting to create these successful colonies in these areas in the north. So, this family called, uh, this guy Elias Prelo arrived with his family in South Carolina, and now the Prelo family had previously been called Priuli. And they were a top-ranking Venetian nobility where uh, for 700 years the Priuli family ran the Venetian slave trade. And for the most part, they, when Venice or whatever, right, would conquer different parts of Europe, they would especially take a lot of children and sell them to like the Arab or Muslim kingdoms and stuff for slaves. So they were doing that for 700 years before they discovered Africa is full of people we can gather up for slaves. And um, they, in Venice, they, this family had three different doges at different times ruling, as well as a patriarch of the church at the time that they then came over to South Carolina. So it was a real, this is what I'm saying, like the United States was a battleground. You had this one effort in Massachusetts and what they were doing, and then the idea was to sabotage it. Now the South Carolina uh, counter itself had a counter where this guy, the guy that actually founded the Georgian, or the, the colony of Georgia, came specifically, right, so, I don't know if I have a map. Uh, yeah, okay. Right, so here's South Carolina. And so this guy from England came over and founded Georgia specifically with no slavery. That was like in the founding document of the establishment of the colony of Georgia was that slavery was outlawed. And he was trying to do a lot to get, because uh, it is true he brought over prisoners and stuff like that, but most of them were just dead prisoners. And so he uh, recruited a lot of his families and tried to get them to um, settle there and really develop. But this got also really sabotaged.
because a lot of them were just lazy bums. And so in South Carolina, you would just get all this propaganda about how great it is to have slaves. You don't have to work. And so it really started, um, because what they were growing, I mean, yeah, Georgia's hot, it's swampy, it's wet, right? And it really started a lot of these popular lines that are still taught today about why slavery was brought to the South was because um, the heat and the mosquitoes, like white people just couldn't take it. <laughs> but these African slaves, they could, they had the stamina and the immunity somehow to work these rice fields. And so at the time, there's this big battle in Georgia about whether or not they were going to, um, you know, after several, several years, whether or not they were going to uh, legalize slavery. <coughs> so you had the bombs who didn't want to work, like talking about how, oh, we just can't work. And then these other groups that had come over, especially these specific religious sects who were being persecuted in England that came over and joined the Georgian colony, they're like, what are you talking about? And so they would, um, you know, publish all of their, you know, incredibly successful crops of rice. Like they were producing so much rice. They're like, what are you, what are you talking about? White people can't do this. So it was a real battle, but eventually, you know, slavery was legalized, but it was it was just a constant battle and constant sabotage of what this Republican force was trying to accomplish and the type of society they were trying to establish in North America. So, so part of this group about splitting the United States, um, right, because then we had the War of 1812, which unlike today, we had to force the president to go to war. Uh, he was, Monroe was very reluctant. And, um, but then, right, the War of 1812 ended in 1814, 15, 1815. But this Essex Junto group had organized the Hartford Convention. And it was supposed, this was in 1814, and it was supposed to be where all the northern states would get together and express their grievances about the United States, especially about slavery in the South and stuff like that. But the that was blocked. I and mean, they ultimately ended up holding this convention, but it was a complete it was completely politically neutralized by a pamphlet printed by Matthew Carey called the Olive Branch. And so it was a political pamphlet where he went through, I mean, like the War of 1812 is going on. So he goes through how, right, the British are the real enemy and the United States has to stay together to fight this and, and just goes through all these programs, right, for how each side is both, right, the Democrats and the Federalists, like both parties, have both been wrong and they've both been right. We have to work together. Here's the real enemy. And he exposes what this um, conspiracy group, what this Essex Junto is doing. And so they're, they're exposed and the, the operation is really for the moment stopped. And, uh, and then this patriotic faction wins again for another day. And obviously we, we win the War of 1812. So this is a good place to get to our friend James Fenmore Cooper because this is a young guy because of Matthew Carey. Now Matthew Carey, right, has this like political bombshell, this total intervention in the United States at this time, in the middle of this controversy, this real crisis. So who's this guy? He was an Irishman who uh, had some political thoughts on England, and he got in a lot of trouble for them. So he fled to Paris, uh, and he had been publishing a couple political tracts in Ireland. So he has to flee, and he goes to Paris, where he meets Benjamin Franklin. And Franklin sends him to Pennsylvania, and all my notes are um, Okay, so he goes to Philadelphia and he's really promoting Franklin's scientific work. So he's become a huge promoter of Franklin's work. He starts writing economic tracts and since he
he has this experience in publishing, he becomes the publisher of James Fenmore Cooper's work. This is Matthew Carey's Cooper's American Publisher. He also becomes the publisher of another very important author slash secret service agent who works with Cooper. Any ideas who it might be? Well, yeah, it's Edgar Allan Poe. Although I bet you he does publish Irving. I don't know. But so Edgar Allan Poe. So isn't this just wild? And what is going on here? You just got Cooper, Edgar Allan Poe, who everybody knows is just an insane alcoholic opium addict, right? Huh? Yeah, all of that's a total lie. Just one big complete lie. And they're really um, intelligence agents through this organization called the uh, Society of the Cincinnati, or the Cincinnatus Society, which was founded after the American Revolution um, in 1783. Around the time of all these constitutional conventions, this group, this the, the leadership of the revolution, Washington, Lafayette, von Steuben, um, some other very important people. This guy for a plank, it was at his home. I don't know much about that guy. But so this uh, cadre, the real elite cadre leadership of the American Revolution, they get together, they form this secret society um, with the idea of it being hereditary, so that the sons of these people could join the club, so that they could create the next generation of leadership for the nation. And so James Fenimore Cooper's father, William Cooper, served in the Continental Army under Washington, and he was a member of this Cincinnati Society. And as far as Edgar Allan Poe goes, his grandfather was the quartermaster general of the Continental Army. His name was William Poe. No, David Poe. Something like that. But his grandfather uh, worked very closely with Lafayette and was also in this organization. So that's, that's what they were doing. They were raising their children to be the nation's next cadre with the idea that they knew the United States was going, it was going to inevitably come under military attack, but also these, these, this cultural attack and all types of conspiracies. And, and so they wanted them to figure out how to detect these things, how to counter it, how to really be creative and continue the ideas of the American Revolution. So in that, that's what we created what the British created under Shelburne, and it was run by people like Jeremy Bentham, was the British uh, Secret Intelligence Service. And there's a lot of intrigues from them. So we're gonna come across a lot of those characters pretty soon. So, but Cooper, now his father, William Cooper, it's gonna be way too long. Um, okay. Here's his father. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's, well, there's it is in color. By Gilbert Stewart. Um, he was recruited by Washington. Have you guys heard of Cooperstown? Yeah. Right. So he founded Cooperstown. Because after the American Revolution, you had all these lands that we had either, through a treaty, like they became ours, or they had been Tories' properties that the states had now confiscated, many of the Tories having fled. So the country had a policy of selling land for very cheap and getting it um, settled. And so William Cooper, Washington asked him to help start settling these frontier areas of the state of New York. And so that's what Cooperstown was. But the counter to that, okay, now Alexander Hamilton was his lawyer. He was very, William Cooper was very close friends 
with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay. And John Jay's son, William Jay, ends up being also the really close childhood friends of James Fenmore Cooper. So the kids grow up together. So, uh, so Hamilton is the lawyer for William Cooper in all this, you know, just the legal stuff you have to go to, to with procuring land, millions of acres, right, helping it get settled and stuff. Now, the, uh, Now the other faction, the Tory faction, was using, okay, in the time period, around this time period, Aaron Burr had been named the state, state of New York's Attorney General and Land Commissioner and U.S. Senator. So he was helping, and then he became the lawyer of a lot of different of these land companies that were trying to seize the Holland Land Company, well, this guy, Theophile Sazanove, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but he he was Swiss, one of these British agent types who was working with Amber, and they got this big chunk of land. Then the Holtney Associates, another land company, led by Colonel Williamson, who is the Williamson that that uh, that Ambassador Mary said was working with Burr on this whole splitting of the United States kind of thing. So Williamson had been, he was a colonel in the British Army during the Revolutionary War. Obviously they lost, so he had to go back home. He marries a Connecticut girl and he comes back to the United States. He gets himself elected to the New York State Legislature. He gets himself naturalized as a U.S. citizen because the whole illegal thing about this stuff, the guy, the fact that this theophile guy, and then this, no, I think the McComb people, but then Colonel Williams, his company, none of them were actually American citizens, and it was against the law for aliens to have land in the United States, but Burr politely overlooked that fact as land commissioner and as their lawyer. So he gave them lots of land, but anyways, Colonel Williamson actually had himself naturalized as a U.S. citizen and uh, gets elected to the state legislature, and then he and Burr are working together to actually change the law in the state so that foreigners could own land in the United States. And we're talking about millions of acres, look at this. So basically the British, and then Fort Oswego is still British occupied. So the whole border of the state, the border between the US and Canada and the state of New York is all British controlled, right? And so then, you know, over here, Albany is like up here at the head of the Hudson's so over here ish. Be like Cooperstown. So they're creating this counter to this operation that's going on in here. And you just see this more of this butting of heads between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. As they're each taking up the cases of these two factions in this state. So it's really fun. The United States as a whole is a battleground, but then each state sort of has its own also internal battles going on, and Aaron Burr and Hamilton are definitely involved in this state. So, okay. So James Fenimore Cooper, um, he grows up, he goes to school, he goes to Yale at the age of 13, which I thought was like, wow, that's really impressive, but it was pretty normal at the time. So he goes to college when he's 13, and has a heck of a time. He eventually gets expelled after a couple of years because, you know, he pulled a few pranks. He trained this donkey to sit in the professor's <laughs> lecture seat. And then he also blew up the door of some other kid's dormitory, which seems really wild. So on the one hand, yeah, he was a wild guy, but again, this is the generation right after the revolution. And there's also this incident, it's very vague, but one day Cooper just gets the crap beat out of him by this other, this fellow schoolmate. And there's not really too many details, but he makes it home and he's so beaten and bruised, like beyond just the schoolyard fight or something like that, that his guardian at the time takes him, like goes to the police and, and sues this other kid, and there's this whole big court case around it. But
but this picture that Tony Chaikin makes in Treason in America, because again, this generation right after the revolution, this is a crucial generation, but all the universities like Harvard had been taken over, Harvard especially, specifically, was taken over by the Essex Junto, the, the entire board of, you know, Harvard University, except for maybe one or two seats of decent people, was all this Essex Junto, this Tory faction. Essex, E-S-S-E-X, -S -S -E and then Junto is J-U-N-T-O. But I have something for you, Evelyn. I printed out something for, for you. Um, yeah, Essex Punto. Um, right. Uh, and and they, were, they were just cranking out hoodlums. They were destroying these young people. Specifically, um, well, they were just like, the, the young people just ended up being total, it was, a, it was like the 68ers, it was like Columbia University in 68 or something like that. These young kids were just hooligans and they were just forming gangs and just terrorize the town, tear up the university. Uh, so that was one thing, like the, these kids were just being turned into little radical terrorists. And then, Intellectually, which is going to come up, uh, Poe really takes, especially he really takes this on, the transcendentalists and what was being promoted in culture and literature out of Harvard in the early 1800s. There was specifically, there was this club called, uh, the Phi, Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard. And that was the, the transcendentalists. So what they were doing, they were attacking explicitly the classics and Augustine eras. Like literature and works of art in time periods that actually, like St. Augustine, Augustine, St. Augustine, the idea that every man is sacred, reason, that, that classic idea. They were attacking that, saying that these are just the old rules. It's totally like the hippie, sixty or stuff. These are just the old rules, man. It's so oppressive. You know, it's our domestic master. They would call these ideas of culture your domestic master. Using, obviously, the, it's sophistry, but using the American Revolution, like we overthrew a foreign master, now who's the domestic master? It's these rules. And, uh, and then they were also promoting the idea that the purest idea, the ideas you really want to write about, you want in your poetry, is the purest idea, which is just whatever you think of first. Don't overanalyze it. Don't try to figure out if it's even a good idea. Don't worry about what future generations are going to think about it. It's just the pure idea. It's yours. And then also a lot of, but then that, which oddly coupled with sense perception. These transcendentalists were very strict on the fact that whatever you write about, you have to have a sensual experience of it, right? So Thoreau had to go live out in the woods, like that, just that you had to experience it with your sense perception in order to know it and communicate it. So this, this is an attack against the United States, because what was Franklin? He was a scientist. The idea of the human mind for reason figuring out unseen principles. And uh, and then there was this other guy, we don't have to go into it, okay. So he gets kicked out of the university. Uh, he goes home, doesn't know what he's gonna do. And his tutor at the time, the funny thing at Yale is they also really just banned fiction and theater. Like you could read Homer, you could read Virgil, the classics in terms of fiction, but in terms of just fiction novels, especially theater. If a student was caught being in a play or attending a play or auditioning for a play, they'd get this heavy fine. It was really insanely strict cultural atmosphere that they had these kids in. It was really strange. So
so he, but Cooper loved, imagine that, loved fiction novels. And uh, so he goes home and he's got this private tutor, because, you know, dad doesn't know what to do with him. And, uh, and the private tutor real, like figures out the only thing this kid loves is to read. You know, he's not big on geometry, isn't really excited about, you know, ancient Greek grammar, but man, this kid is passionate about reading. So he really indulged him and encouraged that, because it was the only thing he could figure out that this kid liked. So eventually he runs away, and uh, he goes to New York, goes to Philadelphia, and he gets a family friend. He decides he, he wants to go on the sea. He wants to be in the Navy. And so, um, given that that was not very safe at the time because the British would just seize any ship we had and all this kind of stuff, his family uh, friend got him on a merchant ship, so a trade ship. So this is his first experience. He gets on, he doesn't know anything about boats, you know. So there's a lot of funny stories about that, but... So his, his first trip is they're trading flour, wheat, right, from North America, and it, it goes to England. And on this trip, four different times, he experiences impressment. Not on him, because he's just like a scrawny young kid that doesn't know anything about boats. But you guys know what impressment is? Yeah. yeah, the British would just take whoever they wanted, almost, within certain bounds. They would take whoever they wanted and force them to work on British ships. And, uh, which was necessary, given that they were a maritime power, you had to have, you know, hands manning your ships. So, this happened four times, where this one guy, he, um, he was on their ship, and they get, they go to England, and, um, he had been impressed before. He had already served on a British ship. Now, the British, they're, you know, they also have a code of honor, right, in war. So that they didn't, they would only seize you if they really, really, really thought you were truly a British subject. Truly, a, you know, born in England or one of their, right, territories. So, so this guy had been done for somehow, if you can somehow, while you're you know, like working on a ship, somehow, if you can get evidence that you are in fact an American citizen, then they would let you go. So somehow this guy did that. He got evidence of his American citizenship from the state of New York. Um, and so the, the captain of that ship was like, oh, I'm so sorry, and he writes a letter uh, saying this guy's an American citizen. And so that guy had to keep it with him. And so anytime like an officer came, he had to like show him the letter, like, no, this is for my own government. I'm really an American citizen. So they wouldn't touch him. So, but then there was this other guy who didn't have any evidence that he was an American citizen or anything. So he got taken. And then, it happened a couple more times, and then they go through the magic, whatever, they're doing their trade thing, and then they get back to England, they're about to sail home. So they kind of have a day while the new cargo that they're going to take back to America is being loaded. Um, so they're, they're going around London, and this sailor, while he had been impressed, he'd been on some thing where they won a victory and got a bunch of loot, so he was owed money. So he goes to the office, wherever he had to go, the War Department, to collect his money. So he had to prove that he was on that ship. He gives the guy his certificate, and the guy's like, okay, it's just gonna take me a few minutes, I gotta go do some paperwork. Just come back in like half an hour. So he leaves, and then he gets spotted by these people who are trying to take, to impress people, and so um, he's stopped, and of course he doesn't have his paperwork now to prove that he's an American citizen, so they take him. And so, so they get back on, and so all those like continuously happen, right? Like Cooper was with him. Cooper and his friend Ned, they were with this guy when he got taken, and then these other three, two other, two other people end up getting taken. And so, and he also makes these comments about how when they were sailing, it was just hundreds 
the British ships would just be everywhere. It was just like Cooper's first realization that the British rule the world, like they dominate. Our Navy has like maybe a dozen ships. Like on any given day, they would have hundreds in patrol in any port, in any area, any sea, any ocean. So it's definitely his realization of what the real political picture of the world is like. Right? We kick them out of our 13 little colonies, but that's not the whole world. So obviously that's very, that's a strong impression on him. He goes back to the United States and, um, I don't know all these details, but pretty soon after he gets back, his dad is murdered at a political meeting and uh, just hit in the back of the head or something, just killed. And, um, you know, very political, but no one was able to like, investigate it and figure things out about it. Or they just, I don't know, I don't know, it's very vague. Anyway, so his dad dies, gets married, and soon launches his career, right, of writing novels. And his second novel is The Spy, which is in the United, in New York, time the American Revolution, right, the, the main character, the hero of the story, is this spy for the U.S., who everyone thought was British because he was a spy. Um, and it's a huge success. And immediately, Cooper is just, like, his next few novels are just global bestsellers. And because you had had <laughs> Schiller and these other poets and, and authors in Europe that had the ideas of the American Revolution, but they didn't have the political freedom to just write about it explicitly. And, and now that we had the United States and we had a profound author, it was just that capability and it's powerful. These books, in terms of embodying the ideas of the United States, they're just powerful. So they were sold all over the world, like translated into German, Italian, French, Persian, Hungarian. <laughs> and, oh, one thing that's really funny, in Germany, they just gobbled Cooper up. And, uh, and the German Boy Scouts were called the Pathfinder, like the Pathfinder. And then um, the last bottle of wine at an evening drinking party was called the Letzte Mohikaner. So the last one So Cooper's, you know, books were just, became, this, well, his first one's called Precaution. It was kind of a dud. It, I, I don't know. But after that, he figured it out and started writing great books. So then, um, so he founded this bread and cheese club where people like Washington Irving, Samuel Morse, just all the, Republican uh, literary and artistic figures in, the, in New York City would get together. And the Society of Cincinnati organized this return trip of Lafayette, right, who had been one of the founders of the Society of Cincinnati. And he ran the Society's French branch, uh, and probably the whole European branch. Um, so they, at this time period, there's just way too much to get into, but he he's invited on a tour of the United States because of this Tory faction and the success that they had really had at undermining the American Revolution, the series of either compromised or flat out traitorous presidents we had had in all types of intrigues and all types of operations. So they organized a trip of Lafayette to come back to just revive the patriotic spirit. And it was an incredible success. He toured the United States for 13 months. And uh, Poe, that's where he met Poe, down in Virginia. Um, he was a part, Sir, uh, General Winfield Scott, who was gonna be later be a Whig presidential candidate, he was in the um, society, he was, he became a member of the Cincinnati Society and specifically became head of military.
military intelligence. And Winfield Scott and the guy who had been under him, his aide de camp, Colonel Worth, they are the ones that had snuck into France and got the Ecole Polytechnique's textbooks and brought it back to West Point. And Colonel Worth is the commanding officer over Poe in Virginia when he was in the army. And so Winfield Scott and Colonel Worth really took Poe, you know, under their wing and introduced him to Lafayette. They got Poe, his cadetship at West Point. And so, so this whole youth generation in the society, they're meeting Lafayette because they're all about to go to his home in France and start doing all these, what? 1824. Is that General Lafayette? Yes. Yes. Oh, we have a <coughs> picture of him. Here he is, not in a white wig. I like this picture. This, um, this one's by Samuel Morse, another you know member of the this intelligence network. This is the one he did when there was a contest of who would get to paint Lafayette's portrait when he came on this visit, and Samuel Morse won. And he's one of these collaborators with the inventor of the telegraph, right, the Morse code. He's also a painter and one of these intelligence agents. And so this is his portrait of Lafayette when Lafayette came to visit. So it was this 13-month tour. He toured the entire United States, which was much more than these 13 colonies. Now it was, you know, Kentucky and all this western area. And, um, and it was just a huge success in terms of reviving American patriotism. And it swung the vote. He was supposed to go on this whole tour, and he stayed in Washington, D.C. at the time of the Electoral College vote, um, really to help swing the vote by presence. Because he first came to New York, then to Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, they had John Quincy Adams come and meet up with him. And so John Quincy Adams was seen everywhere with Lafayette in Philadelphia, then they went to Washington, D.C. And so even though Jackson at the time was the Democrat presidential candidate, and he had won a majority of votes, but the Electoral College ended up voting for John Quincy Adams, clearly because he was a real patriot and he was of this tradition and just a fire was set in terms of, yeah, the American Revolution, and it was clearly just reassociated or associated with John Quincy Adams because of Lafayette's presence. Anyway, so it swung the vote, and John Quincy Adams ended up becoming president, which really saved the nation at that time period. Um, so then these guys go to France. They're um, in Paris, and running just all kinds of intelligence networks. Cooper is just in contact with, he's just gathering intelligence from Constantinople, from Italy, just all over, you know, funneling it to the United States. While Carey is publishing all his books, like he would write a book like every few months or something, in his life, I mean, he started writing as an adult in 1820 was his first novel. He would write 32 novels plus many short stories, many magazine articles. So he was just cranking this stuff out. He was incredibly productive. So Matthew's publishing his books in the United States and then Cooper would also tell Carrie, he would communicate what the popular lines are in Europe. And he would get Carrie to write political pamphlets to counter all this gossip and, and these these lies that were just coming out of Europe about you know how the American system could just never work and aristocracies are just a lot cheaper than republics and just all the gossip that was going on to undermine the United States. So he was countering it all. And then Moores and Poe and Cooper, so that's some of their political shenanigans. They're also running this like Polish resistance movement. They're running the Polish revolution out of Lafayette's house in Paris. So this really wild, fun stuff. Um, so there's all these political exploits. But then, you know, what they're doing in the literary scene is really not separate from that. And uh, so 
so there had been all these different magazines and literary clubs set up in the United States. Most of the press was all British owned. Um, yeah, even then. Nothing's new, right? Yeah. Uh, and they would all just obviously promote British literature, British culture, British ideas, British economics, um, British poetry, and then they would just, all their reviews were obviously not honest reviews of Cooper's works and stuff like that, and they were just total political attacks. And so Moore's, Poe, and Cooper are all doing this intelligence work to get at who's really running these literary magazines and stuff like that and calling them out and exposing them. Um, so here's, this is just fun, it's Poe's
dropped the case once the magazines printed retractions of their previous editorials. And so it just really, it just, he just threw a wrench into this whole cultural operation, like exposing the press for who they really represent, who they really are, how they're, you know, shaping the opinions, you know, all in this crooked British anti-American way. So he's having a lot of fun with that. He's ruining a lot of careers of these guys. A lot of papers go bankrupt thanks to him. Um, Is this people on Of course. You should it now? Yes. Uh, writings, since this is a class about Cooper, we should read Cooper's writings. Um, this is from a book called Gleanings in Europe, and he wrote several different gleanings in Europe, one England, Italy, different countries. So this one's from England. What? Oh. In this whole discussion, this is 1837, it's published in 1837, and this is from his trip there in the 1820s, and probably 1828 or something like that. And what he's talking about at first is the whole discussion of the dissolving of the Union. Did somebody read? Yeah. I have myself been present when this subject was discussed in Paris by men who are in the secret of states. And I well remember the surprise I felt in hearing the possibility of recolonization suggested. On that occasion, when I gave the failure in 1776 as a proof of the impracticability of such a project at this late day, I was significantly reminded of the hundred millions that England has subjected to India. One thing is certain, we estimate our own security very differently from what is estimated here in England. It is the expectation of Europe generally, and of England especially, that we shall separate. And to this end, it is probable that the efforts of those who plot our overthrow will be directed. Little, I might almost say nothing, is known in America of the means that are employed by the privileged classes of Europe to maintain their ascendancy. We have heard a great deal of the machinations of infidelity and of the infamous schemes of demagogues to overturn the existing order of things in these governments. But scarcely a whisper has been breathed against the plots and inexcusable agencies that are universally attributed to the friends of despotism and aristocracy, but the friends of liberty. I'm sorry, it's supposed to be by the friends of liberty. Sorry. Yeah. By the friends of liberty. Right, so we hear all about these demagogues who are trying to upset the order of things and overturn governments, but the friends of liberty aren't saying anything about the operations that are being done to actually overthrow us. Little accustomed to think for ourselves, with a corrupt and interested press, we have lent greedy ears to ex parte testimony, and ready enough to oppose the principles of the age of reason and of the Illuminati, we overlooked the central circumstances that they are merely the reaction of extreme abuses, and that the root of the evil lies deeper in the disgusting excesses which have been so zealously paraded before our eyes. I can know no more of the past than what I hear, but the fairest-minded men of France have assured me of their deep conviction 
that the machinations of their enemies were principally instrumental in bringing about the horrors of their own revolution. No one pretends that it is unnatural for those who have been ruthlessly depressed to break out in acts of violence when suddenly released. But they believe that agents were employed to excite these passions to fury, and that finding it impossible, finding it impossible to stay the torrents of revolution by resistance, the privileged here in England directed their schemes to bringing it into disrepute by inciting the people to acts that would be certain to offend humanity. So the, I mean, Cooper is publishing this, like making it very public. He then goes on from there, it's just too much to read. He goes on from there to recount the story that uh, Lafayette told him that Lafayette had heard from a top French government official when in this time of a peace treaty after the Jacobin terror, this British guy was visiting France and they're in this room and they're looking out a window and the British guy says, oh yes, that's where so-and-so, you know, one of these leaders of the Jacobin mob, she's like, oh yes, that's where so-and-so stayed. This guy looks and like, how do, you, how do you know that? And of course the British guy says, why we sent him here. And so, so that French guy who heard from this British guy say that, told Lafayette that, Lafayette told Cooper, and Cooper just publicizes this. Really, to give, like, people have to have a sense of what is operating against us. And Cooper gets attacked heavily for this. All these, you know, the reviews of his book. Uh, right, yeah, it is true. Um, And then another book that was really crucial is this book called The Bravo. Because um, to defend the idea of a republic, he has to make it clear that a lot of these systems called republics, like the Republic of Venice, were not republics. So you can't take the model of Venice and say, well, that's just an evil model, and they were a republic. Well, the United States is a republic, and so that's not going to be any good. So he writes this book, The Bravo, to clarify to Americans what they are not and what they really are. Um, we have a clip from that. Yeah, The Bravo. B R A V O. So he's telling this fiction story. A Bravo is like a hired murderer, a hired assassin. And he was in the employment of the Venetian system, the establishment. Uh, and he had gotten into that for all types of personal, just manipulated reasons. Venice got him manipulated into this position. And so it's this whole story of, of all these individuals whose lives are completely destroyed by the Venetian system, all to maintain the Venetian system. And so this is what he says. So halfway through this fiction story, he's just going on, he just stops and, you know, makes this point. Venice, though ambitious and tenacious of the name of a republic, was in truth a narrow, a vulgar, and an exceedingly heartless oligarchy. To the former title, she had no other claim than her denial of the naked principle already mentioned. Right, so she denied to be a heartless oligarchy. That's how she could say she was a republic. Uh, while her practice is liable to the reproach of the two latter, in the unmanly and narrow character of its exclusion in every act of her foreign policy and in every measure of her internal police. At the period of which we write, Italy had several of these self-styled commonwealths, in not one of which, however, was there ever a fair and just confiding power to the body of the people. Though perhaps there is not one, though perhaps there's not one 
that has not been cited sooner or later in proof of the inability of man to govern himself. In order to demonstrate the fallacy of a reasoning which is so fond of predicting the downfall of our own liberal system, supported by examples drawn from transatlantic states of the Middle Ages, it's necessary only to recount here a little in detail the forms in which power was obtained and exercised in the most important of them all. So he goes through this whole description of how their system was. There's obviously no, no vote, no elected representation. You had this noble class. It was all whoever was born into this class. But the Senate itself started to contain a lot of people, right? Because population growth is a normal thing. So a lot of people, the Senate became too big. Like after a while, you have hundreds and hundreds or thousands of people in your Senate. It's just too big to really have effective, efficient decision making or an executive kind of decision making power. So then they created um, the Council of Ten, which is all by lot. And then you had, but then that they didn't find to actually be efficient enough. So they created a Council of Thirteen, also all chosen by lot. Like you picked a ball, and if you drew the black ball, not the white ball, then you were in the council of three. So then he's talking about this council of three. He says, a political inquisition, which came in time to be one of the most fearful engines of police ever known, was the consequence. An authority as irresponsible as it was absolute was periodically confided to another and still smaller body, which met and exercised its despotic and secret functions under the name of the Council of Three. The choice of these temporary rulers was decided by lot, and in a manner that prevented the result from being known to any but their own number, and to a few of the most confidential of the more permanent officers of the government. Thus, there existed at all times in the heart of Venice a mysterious and despotic power that was wielded by men who moved in society unknown and apparently surrounded by all the ordinary charities of life, but which in truth was influenced by a set of political maxims that were perhaps as ruthless as tyrannic and as selfish as ever were invented by the evil ingenuity of man. It was, in short, a power that could only be entrusted without abuse to infallible virtue and infinite intelligence, using the terms, in a sense, limited by human means. And yet, it was here, confided to men, whose title was founded on the double accident of birth and the colors of balls, and by whom it was wielded without even the check of publicity. So who would argue that that was the political system in the United States? Were we that kind of republic? Public? Obviously not, and that's what, that's one point Cooper's making what we're not. Yeah? That's James Fenmore Cooper from this book called The Bravo. Yeah. And this has been the exposing of Venice, what the Venetian system was, has been a real task of <coughs> the Republican faction of humanity for a long time. Shakespeare, Schiller, you know, Cooper, others. To really get at what, what type of evil system exists in the world, we were created to fight against it. And so, um, so basically, at the, at the very end of Cooper's life, he um, he was.
was involved in organizing the um, presidential campaign of the Whig candidate, General Winfield Scott. So this you know, hero of the War of 1812, the Society of Cincinnati guy. There was a real organization, but um, uh, Cooper died in 1851. It's for the 1852 election. And so all throughout 1850 and 1851, Cooper's just planning out this guy's campaign. He's very involved in that. But he dies and just disappears. Um, oh, and so Winfield Scott. I'm sure nobody's ever heard of President Scott. Yeah. So obviously it didn't, you know, he didn't win. It was Pierce. Pierce actually won instead. Oh, was it was an ancestor Barbara Bush. Right. Sure. Exactly, that guy. What? And then, that's, 
it's definitely what we're out to achieve today. We have to have a resurgence of an understanding of the real idea of the United States, not as an empire, but as a republic and what, what that means in terms of what our policies have to be and what our relationship to the world has to be. Because I think that that's the only way that when you read the work, you would get the most out of it. You would have to be political yourself in order to read the writings of someone who's political and actually have it grip you in the way that it should. Well, I mean, I think that's the attempt that they're trying to make by categorizing them in certain ways mm -hmm. so that you don't think of it in those terms, you know, when you're yeah, right. trying to read this work. Well, it's really funny. You look at, um, like, one of his biographers is this guy Franklin Wayne, or Wayne Franklin, something like that. It's one of those orders. Um, and he, he can, he doesn't get anything Franklin is doing except from the standpoint of writing books. And everyone tries to explain, like, why did he, he went to Europe for more material to write books. He met with Lafayette because Lafayette wanted him to write a book about him. Like everything that this guy is doing is only understood from the standpoint of, well, he's an author, so everything he's doing must be from the standpoint of writing a book. And this is not true. Who, you know, what great people in history is that categorizable? It's kind of like the Ned Franklin biography, right? Where it's like, okay, how did Cooper watch the movie? And it's like key figures, and he said, like, Bob oh, yeah, Ned, what's the connection? I mean, it's obviously the one that they described by. But uh, you know, you read the Franklin autobiography, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like this series of amazing occurrences. But there's, there's something outside that's not being said, obviously. No, no, no. All that. No, motivation. I'm just saying that they did not show motivation. Right. It was just, you know, it was human spirit. Yeah, but there was actually, I mean, Frank was not being totally honest for you know, a certain sense of the fire. fire. But, but if, you, if you're in the fight, if you're waging the political battles, you can get, you can see, you know, what's actually going on. So I think if people have more questions for Stefan at the end, we can do that. But what I wanted to do uh, is just reiterate a couple things that, that Scott took up at the beginning uh, and work out what everyone is going to do this week. The Congress are back in their districts, and we can absolutely nail them, and they need it. Um, and we should be very clear what happened on Obama and the War Powers Act is that it is an impeachable offense to start a war without authorization of the Congress. And in spite of the fact that some people call, if you don't have troops on the ground, that bombing people is a humanitarian mission. As Kucinich said very aptly, he said, well, why don't we retaliate for Pearl Harbor then? So um, it's impeachable. And what occurred is fascinating, because Kerry and McCain had tried to introduce this bill to support Obama a couple weeks ago, right after the 60 days expired. Then Senator Lugar and a bunch of people, Senator Lugar had a very eloquent um, editorial, I think it was in the Washington Post, where he said, look, it's, our, our Constitution makes it difficult to get into a war because it's so hard to get out of a war. Once you're in it, you shouldn't be able to take it lightly and just enter a war. And what happened was Kerry and McCain withdrew their support. Yeah, then what occurred is Harry Reid, Pelosi, and others said, that if Obama is censured or there's a hint of impeachment, that Lyndon LaRouche will become a national folk hero. And we can't have that. And that is really the idea of cutting off your nose to spite your face. 
or, or cutting off your head to spite your nose, or I mean, it really because. I mean, look, who is LaRue? She's almost 89 years old. I mean, what is the big deal? But he's been right over and over again. One of the things that we're going to post on the website this morning, which would really be fun, is LaRouche's forecast from last July to this July in terms of the economy. And you'll just see a very spectacular record of accuracy on the economy. So what happened was these Democrats in the Senate who know that it's wrong to bomb people without congressional authorization, nonetheless went ahead and said, we really don't want LaRouche taking over, so what we're going to do is we're going to back up Obama. And what happened was really very devious, because I think it was Boehner who arranged, and I don't know if Alcee Hastings I, can't, I think he must have known that this bill would fail because the Black Caucus, a large chunk of the Black Caucus, has turned against Obama. They're supporting Glass-Steagall. And as I've said before, if the Patterson City Council knows that Obama is against Glass-Steagall, you better believe the Congressional Black Caucus knows that Obama is against Glass-Steagall. Okay? So what happens is Alcee Hastings puts the Kerry, uh, Kerry McCain bill, totally verbatim, on the floor of the U.S. Congress. And the Congress votes overwhelmingly. Seventy Democrats vote with Republicans, and a few Republicans vote with the pro-Obama Democrats. But you get an overwhelming majority, more than two-thirds, who vote that against, that they are not authorizing this war, they are not giving Obama, you know, the, the justification to do this. So it's a very, very big deal. And the key in this thing is LaRouche, because by doing that, they're also saying, you know, maybe we should listen to LaRouche. And one of them, which Scott mentioned, which is, which is extremely significant, this guy, George Miller, who is like a, a sycophant of Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi is the one saying, we can't let LaRouche get in there. So George Miller is completely incensed that Obama is launching this war, this so-called humanitarian mission, without a congressional authorization. So Miller stands up, votes against Obama on that, and then yesterday he signs on to the Glass-Steagall Act. So this is of a piece with what we saw in New Jersey where the AFL-CIO has this New Orleans-style funeral, and the side of the hearse says, the soul of the Democratic Party. That, that people are getting it, and that's why Bob has a few copies of a flyer for the July 9th town hall meeting. The theme of our town hall meeting July 9th is truth over party. We're in a new domain, and the American people really have a sense of that. People are disgusted with the Wall Street faction of both parties, and they appreciate it when someone stands up for truth, whichever party they're in. The party question is, no one cares anymore. It's a question of who's going to defend the Constitution, who's going to defend the Republic. And so Nadler, maybe he's going to be the next Glass Steagall co-sponsor because he was very outspoken on this War Powers thing. He, on the War Powers Act, Nadler was very sharp that we are not a monarchy. So it, this, it, I, I, I'm reiterating this because some people missed Scott's briefing at the beginning, and I want you to have a sense that what we're entering, what Stephanie just went through with this James Fenimore Cooper, this is one of those battlegrounds right now in the United States. Are we going to be run by the British Empire as the Tony Blair weapons of mass destruction? You know, legacy, the Afghan opium trade, is that, are we going to succumb to that? Or is the United States now going to assert its identity? And I have to say, we don't have a bad start. We have a good start. This is a fascinating thing. What happened on Friday in the Congress to Obama is a big deal. So I think what we should do is, um, I actually want to start by looking at the, the back here on these city councils.